A sudden draft from a window that was supposed to have been closed. A chill at the back of the neck. Groans, creaks, and bumps in the night. Man has always been frightened by the dark. Troubled by noises just beyond the reach of lights. Occurrences just beyond the reach of understanding. A very dark, hooded, evil presence came from the hall. I didn't even have to see her distinctly. I just knew this is trouble, you know, and I'm going to do something about it. A ghostly apparition in the dark of night. What was it? And why did it come? An astonishing event occurred on a still summer night in a main fishing village. An event witnessed by the latest occupants of a house with a long history. An event which prompts tonight's search. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. There are stories of ghosts and of hauntings to suit every taste, from the playful to the macabre. But those who have studied ghosts claim to have discerned patterns in their behavior, what might be set down as rules of the haunt. For example, a ghost might be thought of as the spirit of someone who died in emotional turmoil. Further, it seems the spirit remains close to the place associated with the turmoil. Finally, it appears that the ghost wanders in its restless limbo until relieved of whatever its burden is. The best way to learn more about ghosts is to consult a ghost hunter. Hans Holzer understands the rules of ghostly behavior perhaps better than anyone else. It is his business to investigate hauntings. Holzer is a doctor of parapsychology and has written dozens of books on ghosts. Over the years, I've developed some pretty foolproof methods to explore the phenomena scientifically. I've used highly sensitive cameras and even more sensitive people, psychics, to get information which will lead to the discovery of a ghost. But in all my years of ghost hunting, I have never been afraid. After all, a ghost is only a fellow human being in trouble. Holzer may not be frightened by ghosts, but most of the people who call on him for help are. Perhaps this is because it is all so strange, because people instinctively fear what they do not understand. Ghosts are the surviving emotional memories of people who've died tragically and cannot leave the spot of their passing. They keep reliving their final moments over and over again, like a phonograph needle stuck in the final groove. You see, ghosts are not aware that they're dead. Ichabod Crane and the Headless Horseman came to life in the home and the work of Washington Irving. Some who care for the author's retreat think Irving may still be around himself. Holzer was asked to find out. It looked a part of a haunted house, all right. But the more I looked for hard evidence of a ghost, the more doubtful I became. Holzer had to pin down what had actually occurred in the old house. Well, I thought it was rather unusual one day. Our former librarian was reading Irving's will in the basement. And uh, all the interpreters were down there. And we suddenly heard a crash upstairs. We ran up. It sounded like someone had fallen down the steps. And when we got upstairs, there was an iron sitting in the middle of the laundry, fallen from the table. Ghosts have been known to do such things, but Holzer feels there must be a suitable motive. He talked to Joseph Butler, curator of the Irving Museum and Library. 
during your years here, have you ever heard of any legends alleging that ghosts or uncanny happenings abound here? Well, of course, Irving himself said that uh, when he died, he was sure that he would return to haunt Sunnyside as a friendly ghost. Irving's whimsical warning that he might return as a playful ghost didn't square with Holtz's experience, his knowledge of ghost behavior. The ghost at Washington Irving's cottage had no substance after all. But in the little fishing village of Port Clyde, I found a different kind of story. Port Clyde is a fishing village wedged in a rocky enclave of the main coast. Indians fished these waters long before the Europeans came. Then, for a time, the Yankee whalers held sway here. They were strong, practical men. Men steeled for long voyages in search of whale. They were replaced in time by fleets of cod fishermen, the same practical Yankee breed. Now it's lobster that lures the men of Port Clyde, but little else has changed. Making a living from the sea still demands courage and skill, and there's little time for frivolous pursuits and wild imaginings. Carl Schwab has fished Port Clyde's waters for years, a spiritual descendant of the Yankee whalers. He and his family once lived in a house that some in Port Clyde say is haunted. But had Schwab ever seen or heard anything unusual at the old house? Not unusual, not for winds here in the wintertime. But I don't know much history of the house, <laughs> other than what this has come up. So you'd be perfectly happy to see. This is the ghost Carl Schwab was talking about. I first heard about it from brother and sister, Carol Schulte and Bob Olivieri. Carol and Bob had spent lazy summers with their parents in the Port Clyde house Carl Schwab once lived in. It was a fine retreat for the young people. A wonderful old house full of nooks and crannies and creaking wood. It was weather-worn, but comfortable. There was a night in the summer of 1972, however, which was not comfortable at all. It was the night Bob Olivieri became aware of a presence in his bedroom. One night, I was awakened by a noise in the hallway, like a pacing of footsteps. I had no idea what it was. I got up, and the sound stopped. And as soon as I got back in bed, I heard the noise again, these footsteps. I got up again, I came to the same spot, and it stopped. And so then I checked my parents' room, and they were sound asleep. I thought maybe it was my three-year-old nephew. I went down the hallway, and I checked in his room, and he was sound asleep in a crib, and my sister was sound asleep. So then I came back in bed again. Um, and while I was in bed, I got in bed, I heard the footsteps again. And um, they were coming up the hall, and they stopped. It seemed like it was at the edge of the hallway. And a few minutes later, I could feel something on my sheets, like a pressing, like someone pressing down. And there was nothing there, but I could see, I could see the sheets being indented. And it, it kept on coming up my body till finally at the end, something pulled my hair. And um, I was just scared for the rest of the night. I couldn't get to sleep. Carol, um what exactly happened to you in this house when you slept here one night? Okay, first of all, I was sleeping in this bedroom in here, which is um, generally my mother's and father's bedroom, but I just happened to be sleeping here that night. And I was in a deep sleep, and uh, my girlfriend was sleeping in that room with her animals. Now, one of her animals, a Siamese cat, came in and woke me up, or tried to wake me up several times, and I finally did wake up. I lie there and I thought, well, It'll go away, you know. And then it just kept rubbing against, like, my face and everything. So I was like this, and I sat up to turn this light on. I said, this is the only way I'm going to get rid of this cat, by turning the light on. And I sat up to do that, and I never got the light turned on because I sat up. I realized that there was a light there, 
And the cat, who is still here, was also looking at, you know, this light, which was right at this window. At first, I saw a little figure. It was female. And she had her hands up to her mouth, as so though she wasn't quite sure whether or not she wanted to do it. She was very shy, you know, going like this. And, uh, of course, all this happened in a matter of split seconds. She got larger, and I realized that uh, definitely it was a female figure with a white, very, the brightest white I'd ever seen, nightgown on, and s very small shoulders, you know, slender. And I said, Marion? Marion? Carol awakened me in the middle of the night by calling out my name quite urgently. And I woke up, and the first time I heard my name, I didn't want to respond to it because it frightened me. And then she screamed out my name louder again, so. So I blinked my eyes again, and I realized that I could see through her. And I realized then that it wasn't Marion. And um, she right away started communicating to me through her hands. Now her hands started to go through washing movements. And um, she got larger as she came to me. Now, as um, I got uh, scared in direct proportion to her approach. <laughs> And I knew that she wanted me to do something. She was desperate in a way. And uh, at that point, I really was scared. And I uh, ducked under the covers, so to speak. And I just called Marion. And then she screamed out my name louder. And there was quite a note of urgency in her voice. So I got out of bed. And I went running across the hall to the room in which she was sleeping. And she clutched at me and said, Marion, I, I have just seen a ghost. And I believed her because it, it was very real. Past my fear, I sensed that there was something evil. There was an evil presence. If Bob, Marion, and Carol truly experienced a ghostly visit, then Hans Holzer must determine whose ghost was abroad that night and find a way to put it to rest. Hans Holzer is convinced there is merit to the eyewitness accounts of a haunting at Port Clyde. He has enlisted the help of psychic Ingrid Beckman for the next phase of his investigation. Ingrid works as a book designer for a New York publisher. She became aware of her psychic abilities, her special sensitivities to emanations, five years ago and has worked with Holzer on a number of similar investigations. She knows nothing about Port Clyde, the former occupants of the old house, or the circumstances of the haunting. Hans, immediately I feel uh, the presence of a woman. What about this room? Well, this presence uh, comes from another house that was on this property, so that I don't feel it in any particular room but I do feel um, that I should go upstairs because I think there'll be more up there. Hans depends on Ingrid's sensitivity to impressions of the past that may remain in the structure and to any non-visible emanations she may detect. As I go through this house, I can see in my mind's eye the house that was on the property before. And in my mind, I sense a field back in this direction. It was land that went with this. Now we're upstairs. Uh, I want you to look at every room mm -hmm. and give me your impressions of it. Well, the upstairs is the most active. Um, I sense a woman who is waiting. And I have an impression now of a storm that she is very upset about, a gale of some kind. It seems to be November. Uh, I also feel that that she has looked out of not this very same window, but windows in this direction of the house. And I just got an impression where she says um, she, meaning a schooner, was built on the Kennebec, the Kennebec River. It seems to be a, um, oh, I think it's a double-masted, double-masted schooner. And it seems to be her husband who's on this. Ship registries of the 19th century confirmed that a whaler named Catherine sailed from these waters. Records of her crew, however, are lost. What does she look like? Uh, I see a tall woman who's rather thin and frail with dark hair. And it appears to be uh, a white gown. Could be a nightgown I see her in. 
Looks like a nightgown to me, with a little embroidery on the front. Hand done. Better see if she cares to make contact All with right. us. We'll go back into that first room, then. If the entity is present and wishes to talk to us, we've come as friends. She's very unhappy here, Hans. Um, she, she says her family hails from England. I get her name is Margaret. Um, Margaret what? Something like H, something of that sort. I'm not getting the whole name. What period are we in now? This is, now she says 1843. Uh, she's very unhappy because she wanted to settle in Kennebunk does not like it here. She doesn't like the responsibilities of the house. How did she get here? Her husband liked it in this fishing village. She was very unhappy about his choice. Now, is she here? She calls Kennebunk the city. That to her is a center. Why is she still here? She's left with all this responsibility. Her husband went, went on a ship. Her husband had a commission. What kind of a commission? On a, a whaling ship. What was the name of the ship? St. Catherine or St. Catherine's. The ship didn't come back? No. Where did they get married? In what church? Lutheran. Does she remember the name of the minister? Thorpe. Thomas Thorpe. When they were married, was that in this town? No. What town was it in? Long way away, some kind of a province of a place. And they came right here after that? Went into Sacco. And then where did they move to? Clive, Clyde, Fort Clyde. Now, she and her husband lived here alone? Two children. What were their names? Philip. But he went to sea. And the other one? Francis. Did he go to sea, too? No. What happened to him? I think Francis died. What did he die of? I get cholera. What? Cholera. Cholera. And? He was 17. Ingrid has come up with some hard information about the ghost. The family name Hatton, the time they lived in Port Clyde, and a ship named Catherine. Holzer would eventually seek out the town historian, Colonel Albert Smaley, for corroboration. Now, to the best of your knowledge, uh, does the, the name Samuel and Hatton mean anything in connection with this area? Yes, yeah, Samuel Hatton uh, lived at Port Clyde uh, prior to 1850. That I'm sure about. What profession did he have? Sailor. Was there a ship called the St. Catherine in this yes, part? Yes, there was. And uh, would it have been built at the Kennebec River? Or uh, connected with it in some way? As I recall, it was, and I believe it was built in the Sewell Yard in the Kennebec River. Do you know the area of Port Clyde where the Leah Davis house now stands? Uh, prior to the, this house, uh, was there any, uh, were there any houses in the immediate area? Uh, I've always been told that there was a house there. Uh, the Davis had owned it, told me that he built on an old cellar. And how far back would that go? The new house was built around 1870. And there was one before that? And there was one before that. A sailor's wife, living alone for months at a time, in a town she didn't like, with the burden of her duties weighing heavily on her. Heavenly enough holds her things to have kept her long past her time. The problem is clear. Free her if he can. And she's alone now? Yes, she is. Is she aware of her passing? No, she's very concerned over the flocks. She says it's now come April, and it's time for shearing. Is she aware of the people in the house now? She wants to communicate. What does she want them to do for her? She wants to, for them to help her with the farm. 
She says it's too much. And she, the soil is all rocky. And she can't get labor from the town. She's having a terrible time. Can you see her? Yes, I do see her. Can she see you? Yes. Tell her that this is 1976 and that much time has passed. Does she understand this? She just keeps complaining. She has no one to write letters to. Does she understand that her husband has passed on, that she herself is a spirit? She's free to go. Does she She said to Kennybunk? Any place she wishes, to the city, or better, to join her husband on the other side of life. She said, oh, what I would do for a townhouse. Ask her to call out to her husband to take her away. He's waiting for her. She, she's wanting to turn on the lights. She's talking about the oil lamps. She wants them all lit. Tell her the people here will take good care of the house, of the lamps, and of the land. And she's saying no tallow for the kitchen. Not to worry. And the root cellar is empty. Does she see him? Yes. Are they going off together? Only time will tell if Hans Holzer was successful. We've learned some things from Hans Holzer's ghost hunt at Port Clyde. Learn, for example, that if we accept the possibility that ghosts exist, we can begin to study their behavior in a systematic way. If ghost is more than just a fascinating mental exercise, however. If Professor Holzer is right about ghosts being nothing more than people in trouble, it is our responsibility to help them. It would be nice to think that help would be available to us if our lives went awry, if our spirits were to move restlessly in the night. Lost civilizations, extraterrestrials, myths and monsters, missing persons, magic and witchcraft, unexplained phenomena. In search of cameras are traveling the world seeking out these great mysteries. This program was the result of the work of scientists, researchers, and a group of highly skilled technicians. Apparitions haunt the countryside of England. Spirits, it is said, lurk in the meadows that once rang with the sound of life. There are those who swear that the dead have risen. Some hear the sounds of ghostly horses hurtling up the stone stairs of a castle. Others bear witness to the cries of an African prince, outraged because he was buried on English soil. The ancient ghosts of England, it would seem, are the scariest spirits of all. Investigator Francis Hitching placed television equipment in a London cellar supposedly haunted by a 17th century cavalier. On a flickering black and white screen, he may have found the last vestiges, the final earthly remnants of a 300 year old warrior.
This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanation, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. The English countryside has been populated by so many people for so long a time that it has acquired a rich legacy of spirits and ghosts. A 200-year-old monarch may pace the library of a great fortress. Henry VIII, we are told, still drags his gout-ridden foot through broken cloisters and cobwebbed passages. Long-dead prisoners plead for mercy in empty dungeons. Ancient druids still haunt Stonehenge. Guillotine victims ride across the rolling plains carrying their severed heads. Every generation has added its ghostly collection of vampires, phantoms, and monsters of the netherworld. Today, a roll call of specters stretches the length of the kingdom. Perhaps it is the willingness of its citizens to believe in the supernatural. Whatever the cause, Great Britain, wrote one expert, is the most haunted place on Earth. Ghosts have a tendency to stay in one place, usually the location of their demise. Since most English castles were built many centuries ago, the apparitions that haunt them have had enough time to scare enough people to become legends. The people who own these castles continue to live in them. Strange sights and hideous noises are considered part of the bargain, along with poor plumbing and drafty rooms. Ghosts are accepted as eccentric members of the family, and in many cases, they were just that before they died. At Wolverton Manor, for example, we encounter the very rowdy ghost of Lord Thomas Trenchard. His story is told by his descendant, Captain Thimbleby. Um, in the early 18th century, Thomas Trenchard, after, no doubt, a very good dinner party, um, with a lot of port in his belly, had a wager with his friend that he could take a horse and carriage up the great stairs, which he indeed did. And in fact, some of the stairs have been repaired where the um, edges have been chipped off. How on earth he got down again, one doesn't know, but um, uh, he won his wager, and we hear him going up the stairs every now and again, over the years. The strange part of Wolverton Manor's ghostly carriage is that it has never been known to return down the stairs. So much for noisy apparitions. Authentic English ghosts are not known to physically attack people. On numerous occasions, however, they have frightened someone to death. This happened on a lovely country estate in Dorset, and the story is told to us by Emma Leavesley. My family had owned this house for more than 400 years, I think, and there were legends that something monstrous appeared in the middle of the night and was so frightening that two of my ancestors had actually gone mad after they'd seen it. I hated sleeping there. I used to dread going to bed because I would always have nightmares there and I'd wake up in the middle of the night and think they were real and there was definitely something horrible about it. Anyway, one night when my grandmother was a very little girl, uh, which was about 1880 or 1890, she and her sister uh, were living in this house. My grandmother at one end of a corridor and her sister at the other end, probably the same room that I was in, maybe even the same bed. One night, they went to bed perfectly normally, having said good night to each other. Uh, and what happened next, no one knows for certain, but it was obviously absolutely horrifying.
My grandmother rushed down the corridor to see what was happening. As she opened the door, she thought she caught a glance of something so horrible that she nearly fainted. But it disappeared almost immediately. The worst thing was that when she looked at the bed, her sister had stopped screaming and she was just lying there dead. I, I hate it as a story and I wish she'd never told me really because I still have nightmares about it and I f I'm sure I feel something that that poor girl went through when I slept in that room. In most hauntings, sounds are more common than sightings and ghostly rituals are usually performed by a single figure. But in our next dramatization, both sights and sounds occur and two 18th century Englishmen are locked together for eternity. Robin Wordsworth owns Bag Lake House and keeps alive the story of the double tragedy that took place in 1759. There was a man who lived here once called Squire William Light. And he had the front of this house built onto an older house in 1719. This uh, we know for a fact. Uh, the rest of the story is really legend. The idea is that Squire Light came home from hunting, perhaps a little drunk. Water was shallow, but deep enough to drown a drunken squire. The squire's groom went searching for his long overdue master. wife found him near the pond. He told her his monstrous tale, then died. That's the story, and it's still believed um, in the village. Uh, people don't care to walk past this house at night, the younger people. And um, during the 40 years I've been here, Quite a number of level-headed people have uh, felt disturbances of various kinds and seen things and heard footsteps which can't be accounted for. After years of horrible, unexplained sounds, the local priest attempted to exorcise both Squire Light and the groom from the household. His efforts were partially successful. Local citizens believe that the squire is now confined to the chimney and moans complainingly 
when the wind blows. The groom, however, lingers outside and faithfully calls his master. Those who share the squire's taste for whiskey claim that they see his specter rising from the pond when the moon is full. As we shall learn in our next story, they should be thankful that he doesn't scream. Most castles are haunted by murky, intangible apparitions. In Marshwood Vale, however, Bettiscombe Manor is haunted by a very tangible human skull that refuses to be buried. When provoked, the skull's angry screams reverberate for miles. Michael Pinney, the current owner of Bettiscombe Manor, is a direct descendant of Azariah Pinney, who was exiled to the West Indies in 1685. While there, he purchased a slave and inadvertently acquired a haunt. The legend of the Screaming Skull of Bettiscombe is the legend of a Negro slave. There's no doubt about that. And that is how it first grew up. It was the legend of a prince from Africa who was exported, went through the horror of the of slave trade, became a slave, came back as a body servant, and he then said to his master, the restitution you've got to see is that I am buried in my own land, not here. I'm a prince in my own country. Well, the... The legend says that he wasn't buried in his own land. He was taken and buried in Bettiscombe Churchyard. buried, horrible screams rose from the grave. Louder and louder they grew until the skull, according to legend, worked its way to the surface. Every attempt to dispose of the skull has brought misfortune to those living in Bettiscombe Manor. As recently as 1914, local witnesses claim that it has sweated blood. Today, it resides on an attic shelf in silence, at least for now. The ghosts of England are not restricted to drafty castles and lonely country estates. In the very heart of London, a 17th century cavalier, replete with plumed hat and pantaloons, resides, in of all places, a wine cellar. In some form, a tavern has operated here for at least three centuries. Currently, it is called the George Inn. Bill Grundy is a documentary filmmaker for the British Broadcasting Corporation. It was the summer of 1975. I'd just finished making a series of television films about the ghosts of London. And I came in here for a drink, and the landlord came over to me, and he said, uh, like the films, pity you didn't do our ghost. I said, you got one here in the George Inn? He said, yes, we have. I said, do you believe in ghosts? He said, no, but my wife does. I asked him to explain. He said, well, we've been here for years, and there'd been no trouble at all, but one day, 10, between 10 and 11 in the morning, anyway, before we opened, he said, my wife went downstairs into the cell, and she came rushing back up, all white.
and trembling and said, I'm never going in the cellar again. She said, it's the fellow down there. I said, we're not open yet. I can't see a man down there. And she said, no, this isn't an ordinary fellow. He's dressed like a cavalier and he's standing in the corner of the barrel vaulting there. My wife still doesn't go down that cellar. Grundy contacted Francis Hitching, an author and investigator of strange phenomena. Hitching placed a camera and a videotape recorder in the supposedly haunted cellar. I've been investigating ghosts and other related phenomena for a number of years now, and this sounds to me a particularly good and typical example of a ghost. That's to say we're here in a very old building, one of the oldest basements in London, certainly part of the old London. Up there is the street itself, and I dare say you can hear some noises which come across it from time to time. And the stories that we've heard, the two people, the witnesses, talking about somebody in Stuart costume, this is typical of the kind of appearance that you get. Somebody in costume appearing in an old building, sometimes at the same time, sometimes not. And I feel that it's one that's worth investigating with modern equipment. Hitching sealed the doors from the inside and remained alone in the cellar throughout the night. He focused his camera on a dark pillar in the middle of the room. Much to my surprise, we have found something. I'd like you to have a look at it. It's a very surprising image, which is coming on the screen in just a few moments. Now, I was here at the time that this was taken, and I saw nothing myself. I think I was looking at the pillar at the time that it was there, but look, coming up on the screen is a most extraordinary something. What is it, a light? It may be, if it's a ghost, is that what a ghost looks like? As I say, I think I was looking at the pillar at the time, but there it is emerging on there. Nobody else was here, and it's not, a, it's, it's not an earthly thing. It's nothing that could be created with a torch. It's got curious images which goes up like that. I think it's one of the most remarkable ghostly manifestations that's happened in my experience looking for them. Whether or not it's something that can be the same ghost that's gone away now. Whether or not it's the same ghost as they saw, whether it's one of these manifestations that happen sometimes when people go out trying to look for things, and instead of specifically what they're looking for, some other thing appears out of the fabric of the building, I just don't know. Until today, my theory was that under conditions of extreme emotion, that's to say great pain, great anguish, even great happiness, that somehow this emotion imprinted itself in the solid fabric of buildings, and people were able to recognize it, and it came out in the same way that clairvoyants and psychometrists, dowsers, can pick hold of a solid object and tell you a lot of things about the people who were last there. That's until today. But today I've seen this thing, and I can't explain it, and so, my explanation yesterday has been torn away. What I believe tomorrow, I just don't know. I'll have to look at that again and again, and perhaps one day I'll find out. What are ghosts? And why do they keep repeating the same actions over and over again? One theory is that a haunting is a violent release of energy, somehow frozen in space and time. When weather conditions are exactly right, the action is played back, like a recording. Impossible. So were Xeroxing and holography just a few short years ago. In fact, so were videotape replays, like the one you're watching right now. People have been seeing and hearing ghosts for thousands of years. Soon, we may know how and why. What a tremendous gain that would be for science, and what a tremendous loss for storytelling.
Ghost hunters believe they can communicate with spirits of the dead. They believe they can transcend the barriers of space and time and see into the past. Actually make contact with the ghost of a tormented person and relive the trauma of some long forgotten tragedy. Can a ghost be set free to move on to another world? Psychics attempt to exercise an evil spirit. If the ghost departs, will an in search of camera capture its image? Strong male presence seems to center around. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. History and fiction both abound with reports of haunted houses. The family in this house is fearful of a demonic spirit that they believe is destroying the harmony of their home. A team of experienced ghost hunters has been summoned. A psychic, seasoned in exorcisms, Sylvia Brown, is placed in a trance in order to make contact with the spirit. In case any ghost should depart from the room, the in search of cameras are ready to document the event. How are the circumstances at the present time? This is a highly charged energy implant. And sometimes the only thing that can break this energy is prayer. Prayers must be said in this house. Prayers must be said over the man at the end of the table. Release all negativity. And whatever is in this house, that is of any negative energy, we command by the will of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit that it goes on to progression and perfection. That there is no negativity left, that there is no black whirlpool of energy. The camera does pick up the impression of something moving. Is it the image of a ghost or some random electronic impulse. Many people believe that a ghost is the disembodied spirit of a person who suffered an emotionally tragic death and who was imprisoned forever in that locale. The spirit lives on as a form of energy, a sudden gust of wind in a closed room, an unearthly cry in the dead of night. These are physical examples of the ghost reliving its final moments as a human. People who claim to be psychics say that by contacting these spirits, they can unlock the secrets of a haunted house. A ramshackle house with a mysterious past is the target of a ghostly stakeout. The rural ranch is 200 miles north of San Francisco and overlooks the jagged California coast. Recently, in search of, arranged to bring a team of ghost hunters here in order to test their psychic skills. In the nearby village of Jenner, preliminary research is provided to In Search Of by Antoinette May, a freelance journalist. She questions residents for background information. The house was built in the 19th century by a rich and powerful family named Rule. Sometime during the 1920s, a mysterious tragedy occurred and the house was abandoned. 
The estate has fallen into ruin. Neighbors swear they have heard the sound of a woman wailing behind the walls and her footsteps echoing on the gravel drive. Undaunted by the legend, new occupants moved into the house six months ago. So Antoinette follows up. Have you had any... Jim and Laura Furlong have lived in the community all their lives and know the history of the rural ranch, why the house is haunted. But the Furlongs are not afraid of any ghost. Is there any indication that you might be moving into a haunted house? The people no. warn you? Uh, the first thing I do is try to take a history on the house, interview the people involved, try to find out what may have happened in the house during their residency there or, or earlier. They agreed to let In Search Of conduct the experiment. The psychics know nothing about the ranch, the family that built it, nor their demise. Sylvia Brown and Nick Nocerino have been practicing psychics for 20 years, working in tandem on more than 200 ghost investigations. Okay. Yeah. You know, it could have been family, but it could have been work hands. This place must they be have anywhere. sheep, but like I said, I felt like goats. The procedure they follow is always the same. They begin to pick up psychic impressions by feeling their physical surroundings. Then they make contact with the spirits and thus can learn of events that happened long ago. Really disconcerting. Well, we get somebody injured by a horse, that's for sure. Most of the time when Nick and I um, have worked together, uh, he has been the photographer and I've been the, the trans medium. I'm the one that's gotten the impressions. It can be a switch off or whatever. We will confer a little bit. Um, almost like a running commentary, what I call psychic stream of consciousness. Every house has uh, some form of energy. We use uh, Sylvia, for instance, as a way of gathering energy. She seems to bring the energy in where we want it so we can photograph it and uh, begin to diagnose it because energy has certain patterns to it and it tells us some of the things we wish to know. Nick says that if a ghost materializes, it appears as a flash of light, too quick for the eye to see. Maybe one more of the house, Sheriff. By high-speed film, he can catch that image. According to Nick, when a house is inactive, as in this picture, his photograph appears normal. But when the same house is alive with the presence of a ghost, the photo lights up as if it's on fire. As the house tour begins, Antoinette records impressions. In the case of uh, Sylvia and Nick, I try very hard uh, to verify their stories. I have never gone on a house uh, investigation with either of them that they haven't come up with amazing hits. Uh-uh, not even news. Sylvia and Nick claim they can conjure up images of the people who lived in the house long ago. Going from room to room, the story is pieced together. But uh, right looking out at the window, we saw her. Yeah, coming up the path, you can see a woman in this window. The 1923 date comes in very strong, and I feel that this was a meeting place, a lodge of some type. A lot of lights, a lot of parties, um, ladies dressed up in very, very uh, elegant gowns. And the other thing that seems to come in really strong about 1923 is that's when I really first felt the, um, the trauma. I want to say Carmela, Carmelita, um, dark hair, dark eyes, beautiful dresses, very lacy, very frothy looking, the kind of petite little 
kind of a accentuated chin. But I think she compensated by that by wearing a lot of rouge. Get the feeling of hopping around. It needs to be very female dominated. Yeah, this wow. house is dominated yeah. by one man. He's a well-to-do man. Apparently, he's uh, got money. He's used to having his way. He's, a, I would say, a very obstinate man, a very stern man. He's a, a controller. He's a ruler. You sure you're not picking up John Rule or John Ruler? Because it seems to fit together. See, yeah, John, John Rule. Rule. John yes. Rule. Whoever he is, I don't like him. Do you have any feeling of anything really dramatic happening here? The girl's crying for some reason. Now, you know, I, I mentioned to you about the fact that she was uh, going to be engaged, I think, but I don't think it ever culminated. The traumas that surround this place is basically female. Um, and there was almost like an insanity type of thing going on with this female who was lost, almost running blindly, not being able to find her way. And I think, uh, I think she's dead. The feeling that the girl died mysteriously prompts the psychics to explore the grounds overlooking the sea. Nick experiences a strong impression of what may have happened. Weakness bothers him. Well, my feeling is that uh, he doesn't think very much of women other than the fact that they're to be used. I feel that somebody was very, very upset, distressed, running away from somebody. But I also think somebody took the cliff. Because right down here, you get this really strong feeling of depression, running, afraid, uh, breathing hard, heavy. I think she's dead. We checked later with Jim Furlong and older local residents. According to them, the psychic story is true. It coincides with what actually happened more than 50 years ago. The experiment is over. Sylvia and Nick have identified the ghost as that of a heartbroken young woman. But the Furlongs have no fear and have chosen to stay on the ranch. In other cases, however, homeowners are frightened of their ghosts and want help. At their next destination, will these psychics be able to free an imprisoned spirit? Nestled in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains of California is a country inn called the Vineyard House. It has been a way station for weary travelers ever since the days of the gold rush. Journalist Antoinette May was contacted by the owners of the inn because they believe their property is haunted. The house was built by Robert Chalmers, a miner who became rich during the gold rush of 1849. But tragedy struck when Chalmers went insane at the peak of his success. His house has been plagued by unexplained phenomena ever since. Recently, experiences have become so chilling that guests, such as Marion Sharp, are afraid to spend the night. Marion had come here for a weekend vacation, but did not have a restful visit. I wakened around four in the morning uh, with an overwhelming sense of anxiety and terror, as if I had awakened from a very bad dream, but I had not had a bad dream. I was immobilized with fear. There was an acceleration of pulse and heart, and I felt terribly warm and highly agitated, and I was fighting tears for a period of time, and then finally I was, I was crying. And overhead, there was a light footfall, as if a woman were walking back and forth across the room. Then there began a series of banging doors, one after another, slamming. We could see nothing in the dimly lit corridor, but we could hear the 
slamming and banging at doors. Well, I'd be pleased to come to dinner, but there is no way that I would ever think to stay a night. Never. Having nowhere else to turn, the owners of the inn asked the psychic team to communicate with the ghost in an attempt to free its restless spirits. Anxious to help, the psychics decide to spend the night. The vineyard house still affords the wayward traveler a warm fire and a hearty dinner. Are they all this busy? Well, this one has a lot of history. And, and, uh, Sylvia's husband, Dal Brown, and Nick's wife, Chris Noserino, are also on the stakeout. Yeah. Did you take notes? Yeah. Oh, As they ready for sleep, the psychics jot down their initial feelings. A strong sense of apprehension falls over the house. Hearing strange noises, Nick ventures into the hallway and begins to pick up psychic vibrations. Also awakened from a fitful sleep, Sylvia joins him. The house seems alive with energy. The psychics try to communicate with the ghost, but contact remains elusive. Ghost hunters enter the cemetery where the bodies of the original owners, Louise and Robert Chalmers, are buried. The psychics sift through all their impressions to piece together the story. Is there a ghost in the house? And if so, is it Chalmers, who had gone insane, or is it his wife? I feel tragedy. I find almost a Romeo and Juliet kind of a tragedy. A woman who loved a very vital man, his demise and her devastation from it. The woman that um, seems to be the strongest influence in this house by the name of Louise, I think in some way has been um, tremendously maligned. I think out of pity, caring and certainly love that she chained this man in the basement in order that he wouldn't hurt himself. And I think in her mind, she felt that she just couldn't send him away to what we might think of an early snake pit type of uh, confinement that they had in mental hospitals. Somebody's singing. It's an old song. It goes something like, uh, I come from Alabama. Uh, oh, Susanna. Banjo on oh, Susanna with a banjo on my knee. I'm coming, I'm coming to thee. I feel that Louise is still in a protective situation in the house. And even this stone is almost like a symbolic reminder that she's still going to overlook her house and protect, let's say, her domain. Her personality is so strong and protecting that it's she that walks the halls. And I think this protection has lasted beyond the grave. I think she's here. Well, I, I think Louise is uh, very despondent over losing her money, her land, 
and everything, and uh, she has a possession on the house. She still sees the house as mm -hmm. fulfilling her ambitions. <laughs> and there are no ambitions to be fulfilled here. She'll be there a long time. Sylvia and Nick say they are unable to expel the spirit of Louise because her presence, her guilt, is too strong. Ghost hunting is at best an inexact process. What determines success or failure is often in the mind of the observer. The ghost seekers believe they have failed, but only future guests at the Vineyard Inn will be able to make such a judgment. Psychics who are sensitive to the supernatural claim it is possible to contact the spirits in a haunted house. Traumas, such as a broken love affair or an untimely death, prevent these spirits from accepting their own demise. Supposedly, they linger in our world, trapped by their own turmoil. Ghost hunters try to comfort them, but they are not always successful. Sometimes the ghost may be freed from bondage. Sometimes it may be imprisoned in its earthly home for eternity. The recent motion picture has mystified and frightened thousands of moviegoers. Most people think the Amityville Horror is a good, scary ghost story. commonly known is that the film is actually based on fact. It's a true story. Was there an evil presence living inside this house? This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. The House of Horrors is in Amityville, Long Island, an unlikely target for an evil curse. Amityville is a pleasant New York suburb the name Amityville means town of friendship. The house that was for sale at 112 Ocean Avenue was a dream turned into reality for the family of George and Kathy Lutz. I described the house as charming the first time I saw it, because that's what I thought of it. You know, I was saying, Kathy, do you, do you believe this? And she said, no, I don't believe this. You know. It's a lovely house. 
we don't feel there's anything wrong with the house. The house is a, it's, it's a happy house. It's a house to be, have a good time in, to have parties in. Everyone in the area knew that the year before, a family of six had been murdered here, so no one wanted to buy the house. The price was very reasonable. George and Kathy decided to ignore superstition and buy it. They settled into their new home just before Christmas. As is common with many Catholic families, Mrs. Lutz asked her parish priest to stop by and bless the house. This blessing began in the sewing room and seemed to set off a chain reaction which would jeopardize the lives of everyone involved. Because of criticism later leveled by other church officials, the priest has never before talked to anyone in the media. In search of was able to locate him, and he agreed to tell us his story, but only if he could remain anonymous. I was blessing um, the sewing room. It was cold. It was really cold in there. And I thought, gee, that's, this is peculiar. Because it was a lovely day out, and, and uh, it was winter, yes, but I, it didn't account for that kind of coldness. I, I also was sprinkling holy water, and I heard a, a rather deep voice uh, behind me say, get out. It seemed so directed toward me that I was really quite startled. I felt a slap at one point on the face. I felt somebody slap me, and there was nobody there. Later, George and Kathy couldn't believe that flies could be swarming in the dead of winter. Then they puzzled over a toilet that, when flushed, these and other events began to unnerve them. Strange events also affected the priest who blessed the house. He discovered blisters were festering on his hands. I went to the doctor for it, yes, and he couldn't explain it. He thought it might be caused by anxiety, and of course that's, that's feasible. Uh, but I, I don't think I'm given over to psychosomatic responses. He called the Lutzes to warn George and Kathy. Noise interference prevented any communication. Kathy? He could never get through. Hello. Hello. Hello, what's up? Hello. Unexplained phenomena in the house increased. Each room had its own personality. Own thing, yeah. In time, you couldn't deny that something was very wrong because too many things didn't add up. Frightening spirits seemed to inhabit the whole house. Kathy felt compelled to talk to the priest. She wanted him to come back and bless the house again. Further attempts to communicate with the priest, Hello. however, seemed to be sabotaged. Father, Father, are you there? Hello. Hello. A faulty phone connection? Hello, Perhaps. For almost a month, George Lutz was attacked by a sensation of intense cold. For days on end, he would neglect his work and his appearance, constantly stoking a fire that never warmed him enough. His personality began to come apart, bringing emotional surges. Confusion, anger, anger uh, misplaced because I would direct it at Kathy for no reason. Uh, moodiness, I lost 20, 25 pounds there easily during that 28 days. Uh, I didn't eat. I didn't go to the office. My values were such that the only thing important was to keep warm and keep a fire going. Everything was very erratic. Our own behavior was erratic. George still believed he could take things in hand and cope with the unknown horror. As I do know, when I met George in the first place, Jay Anson is author of the book, The Amityville Horror. He's an ex-Marine built like a bull, and he's the type of guy who can handle any situation. 
with his fists. He literally can't. So that when he was approached with this kind of phenomena, he had no idea what he was coping with, none at all. He didn't even know the meaning of the terms in phenomena. A new problem plagued the Lutzes. The son of the previous owners had shot six members of his family while they slept in this very house. George and Kathy now were experiencing vivid nightmares in which they relived the murders as though they were the victims. Difficult as it was, the family tried to maintain a normal existence, but each day, something else, strange and frightening, would be discovered. One particular afternoon, I was going about the house rearranging furniture and setting up some storage. I went down to the basement, I went over to one bookcase, which was on the end, and I moved it, and much to my surprise, there was no wall behind it. It was the entrance into the small, brightly painted red room. And I was really surprised and alarmed by the find. The most impressive thing was when we took Harry around. He would not go anywhere near it. He backed right out of there and ran up the steps. This red room was not in the original house plans. Why? Who built it? And what possible use could it have? To this day, these questions have never been answered. George and Kathy could only wonder about the ominous little room. It was just one more aspect of the house they didn't understand. Even the normal rooms caused strange reactions. Missy would sing constantly within the room. And if you called her out or if she came out for one reason or another, as soon as she crossed over the threshold, she would stop singing. Crossing back again, she would pick up the song from the word that she had stopped on and continue. Missy boasted of her new playmate, someone or something named Jody. Jody, said Missy, could take any shape, a doll, a teddy bear, even a pig. And Jody could only be seen by whomever he chose, and he had remained invisible to Kathy and George. Missy even drew Jody in crayons. George and Kathy were amused at their daughter's fantasy, thankful that the terrifying events had not yet touched her. Their amusement faded quickly into horrid fear when Jody made his presence known to them. Missy told us later that her friend Jody could not be seen, actually seen by anyone unless it wanted them to. And that at times it was a uh, little bigger than a teddy bear and other times it would be bigger than the house. That Jody had the ability to, to change its size. One night coming back, I looked up in Missy's room and there was a shape in her room that I don't know what it actually was, and it's coming back from the garage one night. Uh, but I would go out to the boathouse for no reason, check everything out, and then go back. I'd do that a couple times a night. Uh, the reason I mention it, that is because our behavior changed, our, our, uh, the way we would go about living. I would go from the fireplace to the boathouse constantly. No longer did George and Kathy feel they were alone. The Lutzes felt driven to rid their home of the evil intruder. They decided to re-bless each room themselves. That's when things really got bad. We tried to kick out what was there, and it didn't want to go. You go around, you open a window in each room, and you say the Lord's Prayer, and you command it to get out of that room, and you go on to the next room. I didn't want us to go around blessing each room and commanding it to leave. 
in the name of God, we would go around and do that. And when I finished the first time, we heard a chorus of voices scream out, will you please stop? What you're doing, you know. Uh, so that convinced us that what we had tried to do didn't work. And things got very bad that night. We had gone to bed that night and uh, went into a very deep sleep. George woke me and he had backed up from me and I couldn't understand the repulsion in his face. And when I looked up, I saw what caused him to back away and that was my reflection in the mirror. My hair had turned color. There was no true color, it was a Gray white. My face was severely wrinkled, uh, deep impressions coming down across the forehead. My mouth was very tight, very drawn. And the feelings that were going on were confusion, illness, um, just trying to grasp hold of me, you know. By morning, her frightening appearance had vanished. George continued to be obsessed with fire. He would stare endlessly into the flames. Slowly, the chill gripped his very soul. The searing heat was etching a demonic face into the fireplace. It was staring out at him through the flames. What would happen next? We felt absolutely no sense of salvation or outside help. They feared for their sanity, their very lives. You know, all kinds of things were going on that night. Noises were going off downstairs, front door slamming, dogs getting sick, the kids' beds are being levitated and dropping down. A constant barrage of increasing terror finally made the Lutzes realize they couldn't go on. And that was the last night we spent in the house then, because that was, it was ridiculous to even consider staying there, and yet it was very hard for us to leave to just organize all five of us into the same room and actually get out to the van and get us started and drive away with the dog. Only 28 days after moving in, the Lutz family abandoned all their possessions, everything they owned. Possible explanations as to what really happened in Amityville will be examined next. I'm a journalist. I try to investigate as best as I can. When you first hear the Lutz's story, it sounds like a very good haunted house story. Author J. Anson. But then I spoke to the priest at his apartment in the rectory. When I heard his story and was able to put together a chronology of the events that took place within that framework of 28 days, I was convinced there are things out there that Many people cannot explain the phenomena that occurred to the Lutzes and to the father. I sincerely believe they took place. The Amityville house seems peaceful now. There is no evidence that any strange events have occurred here since the Lutzes fled. In search of has previously investigated haunted houses, and we've found that in many cases a human tragedy, such as a murder, has left emotional memories. This may be the explanation for the Amityville horror, or there may have been a much more dangerous force, what psychics and priests call demonic, pure destructive energy, as ancient as time itself.
The nightmares the Lutzes had experienced about the murders previously committed in the house caused Kathy and George to investigate the circumstances. Ronald DeFeo had murdered his father, mother, two brothers, and two sisters. Sentenced to life in Clinton State Prison in New York, DeFeo has claimed that demonic voices goaded him into committing the gruesome killings. Neighbors and acquaintances of DeFeo were astonished at how George and DeFeo looked alike, how they both presented the same appearance. George feared that his recent personality changes were further indications that he might become more and more like DeFeo, and not just in looks. This disturbing revelation prompted the Lutzes to seek out psychic investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren. The Warrens have investigated many disturbed houses, and they examined the empty house looking for an explanation. What started the trouble with the Lutzes was the fact that there were six people who were murdered in that house. The inhuman, the diabolical, are attracted to where tragedies occur, just like a moth would be attracted to a light. And when the Lutz family moved in 13 months after these murders, they were still using some of the furniture that was in there. Uh, we know that vibrations can build up in a home like this of a negative nature, and suddenly we have a psychic explosion. There are those who speculate that this psychic explosion was not really a sudden buildup from the DeFeo murders, but rather that Ronald DeFeo was the object of negative forces already on this ground. Research shows that the Shinnecock and Massapequin tribes lived in what is today Amityville. The actual Lutz home is built on land where these Indians imprisoned their tribal members who were deemed insane, evil, or possessed. Perhaps these tortured souls caused negative forces to inhabit the Amityville ground. This seemingly far-fetched explanation helped confirm something the Lutzes desperately wanted to hear. We believe it was there when we moved in. We don't believe it uh, came to bother us after we moved in, let's put it that way. You know, whatever was there had been there for quite a while. All those involved with the Amityville horror agree on one thing. Some evil thing no one can explain seemed to inhabit the house. Why then was it never exercised? I'm a Roman Catholic priest. And the Roman Catholic Church teaches that people can become possessed, but not objects. The Lutzes were not possessed, so therefore I don't believe they should have been exercised. And I don't believe the house was possessed. There was something there. To this day, no one knows what actually was in the Lutz home. But whatever the explanation, in the case of the Amityville horror, one family managed to escape. For those who lived through the Amityville horror, the emotional shock still lingers. The Lutzes fled to the opposite end of the country, never to return to the house in which they had sunk all their hopes and all their savings. I think I want my family and my children much more than I want a structure. And if you view it in that perspective, it's easy to walk away from. We still have that alone feeling. I guess that doesn't go away. We're glad it's over. For us, it's over. The Lutzes believe it is over. For them, it may be.
One Saturday in 1905, in the city of Manchester, England, a factory worker by the name of William Hope set out to photograph a friend. Mr. Hope, an amateur photographer, had been through the same process many times before, and certainly nothing about this day was different than any other. Once in the developing room, something unusual happened. At first, he wondered if he had forgotten to clean the photographic plates. But it soon became clear what had taken place. The image of a woman had appeared on the photograph. Hope's friend recognized her immediately. It was his sister, who had died 12 years before. Mr. Hope believed he had photographed a ghost. In 1964, this man, Ted Sirios, came to the attention of a group of scientists and psychologists when he claimed to have taken photographs solely with the power of his mind. A series of experiments were conducted that confounded all those present. The photographs he produced were simply unexplainable. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. In 1874, Sir William Crookes, a scientist and member of the London Psychical Society, was investigating the spiritual medium Florence Cook. It was said that Miss Cook would enter a cabinet and materialize a spirit named Katie King. Though he believed he saw her with his own eyes, he was still not convinced that she and the medium were not one and the same person. To clear up his doubt, he opened the cabinet in which the medium worked. In his own words, I examined Katie with steadfast scrutiny until I had no doubt whatever of her reality. <laughs> Vernon Miller is a photographic expert from the Brooks Institute of Photography. In photography, light is reflected from or absorbed by the subject in the photograph, focused through a lens, and recorded on a light-sensitive uh, material, film, plates, emulsion. The film is light-sensitive, so any energy, any electromagnetic energy, can affect the film to some extent. So radiation from all of the, the various ways, x-ray, so forth, can affect the film. So you might not necessarily see the light that strikes the film. I've seen many examples of accidental ghost photography. Uh, I've seen very few, if any, actual examples of the process. Most of the, the ghost pictures that I've seen are uh, examples of double exposure techniques, where uh, one image was recorded against a dark background, and that image superimposed on a normally lit scene so that you can see the brighter image against the, the normal scene. Uh, this particular picture seems to be quite a production. This is not uh, accidental. The photographer wanted to achieve this effect. There are a few clues. The ghost image is quite bright against a darker uh, background indicating that he was illuminated some way that uh, would show him against that. We can see two or three images of the hand as it goes up the banister. Uh, many times there are other clues. Uh, the ghost scene will be lit artificially with a directional light. Uh, as in this crucifixion scene, it appears that uh, these are miniatures that were lit artificially, and then the, the combined scene was done in daylight under a different light condition. Ever since the first photograph was taken in 1826, no images have been more surprising or more controversial than those reported to be ghost photographs. Experts will continue to disagree on a phenomenon that theoretically records the presence of entities that are invisible to the naked eye.
Attempts to cross the thin line between life and death have occupied man's mind for centuries. Perhaps photography, recording the subtleties of light and energy, can provide a glimpse into the other realm. William Hope, Sir William Crookes, and others were convinced this is so. This is known as the Armistice Photograph and was taken on Remembrance Day near the London War Memorial in 1923. It purportedly shows an entire battalion killed in the Great War and gripped the public imagination like few other photographs before or since. But the question of how these images got onto film is still in debate. Raymond Bayliss is a psychic investigator who has researched hundreds of ghost photographs. There are two main theories. One, of course, is that the origin of all psychic phenomena comes from the mind of an individual uh, operating through the subconscious. And the other main theory is that uh, the phenomenon itself is in some way instigated by a surviving spirit. I've taken part in some experiments that I believe were authentic. Uh, that is, that authentic uh, psychic photographs were taken. Now, I'm not going to call them spirit photographs because I don't know whether they were the product of a spirit or whether they were the product of an individual's mind or what have you, but nevertheless, I do believe that they were actually psychic photographs. That is, they were paranormal. Now, this is ordinary Polaroid film, four by five inches film, and it's, it comes in a light, tight envelope. Uh, it can be uh, utilized into any number of normal cameras by inserting it into a holder, a film holder. Okay, we insert the film in the back of the camera. And from this standpoint on, it is just like ordinary wet process photography. And I'll snap this picture and make a little demonstration for you. Now, in wet process conventional photography, there is a step in the dark room where the film is processed and the picture finally uh, printed and Polaroid or instant photography has the advantage of having all of this done in front of you so there's no chance for manipulation of the image uh, other than right here before your eyes so in a few seconds we can open this envelope up and examine the photograph that we just made and here we have the image that we just photographed just now and a ghost-like image of another face that uh, was made uh, prior to the uh, exposure just at this time. I'm familiar enough with this process that uh, I would look at, uh, at any image with a great deal of skepticism. Many times scientists go into experimenters with blinders on. That is, they have become so biased due to prevailing views, uh, customs of thought, so forth, that they're no longer capable of actually examining uh, an experiment. They may, for example, take part in an experiment, admit that all of the controls were perfect, that there was nothing wrong whatsoever, uh, but then a few days later, they suddenly uh, find that their, uh, that their view is changing. They no longer can accept it, but this is not uh, this is not the result of thought. This is the result, as I say, of a prevailing bias. They simply cannot examine an experiment clearly. There have been spirit photographers that have produced real psychic photographs, and in my, uh, in my opinion, and they have also resorted to fraud. There have been some photographers that apparently uh, never resorted to fraud, or practically never. Bouguet was a very famous early spirit photographer one of the pioneers, you might say. He made uh, vast numbers of these photographs, some apparently, apparently real. But in 1875, Bouguet was put on trial for fraud by those who felt that the idea of photographing spirits was preposterous. Fraud could not be proved, and Bouguet went on to produce many more spirit photographs, some reportedly under rigid test conditions. Not all such cases were so bitterly fought. In 1917, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle came upon an incident that soon became well known throughout Europe. He reported that two young English girls, while playing in the woods near their home, believed they saw a gathering of fairies. They returned to the spot soon afterward and took these photographs. Skeptics pointed out the suspicious resemblance to several drawings done by Claude Shepperson to illustrate a poem entitled, A Spell for a Fairy. 
Episodes such as this tended to cast doubts on spirit photography. Natural cave formations in Southern California provide photographer Seymour Locks with fertile ground for picking up energies from past civilizations. Coming into the cave area, what I was uh, feeling was simply that it had been used by somebody. It was just a message that I was getting. There are energies in the earth, sometimes from water, sometimes from minerals, and sometimes from the presence of entities who have used this, because everything in nature has a memory. A uh, rock, whatever, has a memory. And so I would assume that the energies in this area would have to do with the people who lived here at one time, the Indian people, whomever. But it has that kind of aura that but I would assume whenever I work with their entities around, because my supposition is that I'm assisted on the other side by people who create the imagery. He believes that his photographs provide evidence of unseen entities. More than 10 years ago, unexplainable images began appearing in photographs taken by Seymour Locks. After much investigation, he has concluded that he has mysterious assistance, and the strange glow apparent in many of his pictures is energy from unseen entities. This is really a beautiful configuration, and it, it's reminiscent of the uh, opening to the sky that you would uh, find in the mythologies of the American Indian. A psychometrist can hold an object and pick up Im images, sometimes vibrations, etc. A dowser can walk over a landscape and tell where the water or the mineral. Psychic photography, the, uh, the ability to pick up an image uh, is comparable to picking up a clairvoyant image. You're simply using another medium. Photography is a receptive vehicle because it is silver. It has a vibration already. Sometimes the image is impressed while I'm developing. Sometimes it's impressed while it's in the camera. You don't need a camera. You simply need some kind of sensitized uh, paper or film. The silver salts are a receptive vehicle. One of the most spectacular uh, series was with a, a woman, Jerry Isaacson, who at that time was living in Santa Cruz. And I uh, photographed her in a sequence of photographs in which she was doing a massage. And in the five frames that ensued, uh, she became less and less visible. My experiences have been that white light is projected from the healer and that they become transparent. Transparency and, and uh, a luminosity seems to be pre prevalent in those photographs I've made of the healers. In one remarkable photograph, a human face stares at us from another time and space. After a seance, I wanted to see what uh, I might pick up because I was still feeling, as I generally do after a seance, the room is very, very strong because you've been building the energy, so-called, in that environment. The so-called upper levels of consciousness are apparently available more frequently to more and more people these days for whatever reasons we don't know. And they seem to go in cycles. And uh, they tend to come in turbulent periods of time. Perhaps we are still evolving. It seems very possible that the brain, even now, has capabilities which are still untapped. Dr. Michael Graves is a neurologist in Los Angeles and is keenly aware of the bewildering complexity of the mind. How the brain actually works when we do something as simple as think or say a sentence is something that we know really very little about. As clinical neurologists, we know that certain parts of the brain can be destroyed and the individual doesn't suffer. So there are parts of the brain with no obvious, easily identifiable function, but I believe that there must be some function for all parts of the brain. Modern brain scans actually give you a picture that looks as if someone's head has been sliced into serial sections, just as like a, a loaf of bread is cut. This is a cross-section of the patient's brain. 
the intensity of the color indicates the intensity of metabolism of the brain tissue. For example, here we see a red area in the temporal lobe of the brain. That's the part of the brain which is metabolizing or using energy the most intensely. Other areas are yellow or even blue. They are using energy less intensely. This technique could tell us what part of the brain is most intensively, intensely operating during any mental function, including telekinesis or any psychic phenomenon. Once we get that, that step is accomplished, there would still be unanswered questions as to how that part of the brain did that job. In Waterville, Maine, the Veyura family has confounded skeptics with their ability to capture ghost images on film. For 15 years, they have explored the natural hunting grounds of ghosts and have taken photographs that raise questions about man's true nature and the limits of our physical reality. Their odyssey began with a simple parlor game, which evolved into a dialogue with an entity that became their spirit guide. Richard Veyur records the sessions. Could you tell us how he passed away? A, C, C, I, D, E. Ouija first started in December of 1965, and it started as sort of a parlor game or as an amusement. F, R, I. The personality which introduced itself was ACL or Anne Caroline Lowe. She gave information concerning herself as to where she was buried, the inscription on her gravestone, location of the cemetery, so forth. I have a friend of uh, family. That's where I get out. Would it be possible to uh, photograph you? Yes. They were given the location of Anne Caroline Lowe's gravesite. With some trepidation, they visited the site and took this photograph of their young spirit guide. Though they photographed in a wide variety of situations, Researchers couldn't find any deception involved in their method. The personal reason to, to enter parapsychology was to determine the nature of the pictures and of the scripts. Is it possible to communicate with the deceased through Ouija? Is it possible to photograph the dead. Who is communicating? S -S Certain communicators would inform us that there is a return process from their so-called reality to come back into ours in order to communicate. They would have to pass through a tunnel or an alleyway. The opening at the beginning is very wide, and as they come closer to our own reality, it becomes narrower and narrower. They would see us as if steam vapor and water droplets would be falling on upon a piece of glass. Thoughtography and psychic photography or spirit photography or paranormal imagery. If you can't see the image, you're using a thoughtographic process. What we have to determine is what intelligence is producing the phenomenon. Is it our own unconscious, or are we actually photographing uh, a deceased? And is that deceased thoughtographically impressing its image or another image upon our plate? In 1966, in Denver, Colorado, a series of tightly controlled experiments are conducted. Researchers are checking and numbering fresh film and new cameras. The subject of these experiments is Ted Sirios, a Chicago bellhop with an incredible mind and an incredible thirst to match. Ted Sirios' ability is the power to project his thoughts onto film. 
During the experiments, researchers take the pictures while Ted stares into the camera. His concentration is intense. His pulse rate rises to 120 or more. The results are staggering. Images of all kinds begin appearing on the film. A target photograph unseen by Ted and known to only two of the researchers is the image that Ted tries to duplicate. Sometimes, when he is sure he has the photograph, he shouts, I got it that time. An amazing aspect of the pictures is that they often contain small errors in form. They are not quite exact duplicates, like the inverted strut of this plane. It is as though that part of his brain that does these things can't make up its mind about the target picture. Again and again, he matches the target pictures until it is difficult to doubt that he is actually doing what he says he is. One of the most spectacular demonstrations of all takes place in a Colorado television station. In a moment of bravado, Ted claims that he can actually put images onto the videotape. Here are the results of that experiment. Convention tells us that this should not be possible. But if these images don't come from the mind of Ted Sirios, where do they come from? Images from the far reaches of our imagination. These ghostly faces look at us from behind the veil that hides the mysteries of life and death and make us wonder about the reality of ghosts. For centuries, psychics and mediums have attempted to pull back the dark curtain of mystery that separates the land of the living from the realm of the dead. Some claim to have successfully recorded spirit voices on electronic equipment. In 1920, Thomas Edison experimented with a device designed to pick up the voices of those beyond the grave. What were the strange sounds captured by this updated version of Edison's machine? Are we ready to establish direct communication with the spirit world? presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Man has always been frightened by the dark, troubled by the sound of echoing laughter, or hollow footsteps passing down long, empty corridors. At the s and studios in Hollywood, California, there has been a history of occurrences that some say is beyond the realm of understanding. Many of the tales emanate from behind the massive doors of soundstage number one. Mary Pickford once acted here. Cecil B. DeMille directed. One man recreates his own astonishing story. My name is Jerry Fitzpatrick. 
uh, I was the construction coordinator at this studio for approximately four years. It is one of the oldest sound stages in Hollywood. There was one particular night I remember I worked all night by myself. We had a large set to build and I was here alone laying it out. I was tired, but I remember I stepped back over in this area to take a look at what I had done. But at that time, uh, there used to be a catwalk right up here, about 15 feet off the ground, from one end of the sound stage to the other. Uh, also, at that time, there was a staircase that came from this door down to floor level. It was at approximately 2 o'clock in the morning. I heard the door open and close and footsteps coming down the catwalk. I immediately called out who's there, and the footsteps stopped. There was total silence. So I ran up the steps to check the door, and the door was bolted, like all the security doors were, and the alarm system was on. The hour was late, and I was tired, but I heard that door open and close, and footsteps coming down the catwalk. Some have suggested the theory that the dead may occasionally re-enter our own time and space. Confused by their predicament, the spirits may call out for help or attempt to communicate. Many would suggest that the strange noises in this old studio are the product of overactive imaginations, but others aren't so certain. Could spirits actually be attempting to speak to us? One man may have uncovered evidence that implies spirit communication may occur with remarkable frequency. D. Scott Rogo is the author of Phone Calls from the Dead. Well, I first heard about these cases when I first entered the field, which was close to uh, 10, 12 years ago. And I really didn't take them seriously at all. I thought they were very outlandish. It was hard for me to believe that people were actually getting phone calls from people who were dead. But as the years progressed and I did more and more investigations, I discovered that these calls were fairly common. And then I realized that there was a major effect here that someone really had to study. Mary Meredith of Oklahoma City recreates the night she purportedly received a phone call from the dead. Hello? Of course, I don't tell everybody about it because a lot of people still think that I'm crazy when I, they even hear about it. But I know that it was, and it happened to me. Mary Meredith's case occurred in 1977. She, was, uh, she had just been in the hospital. She had returned to her home not knowing that there was a letter waiting for her telling her that her cousin had died. She had been very close to this cousin. It was very soon after she read this letter from her mother that the phone rang, and it was from her, her cousin. It just really upset me when I got the phone call, and I, that's, I hung up on the first phone call because it upset me. But when she called back again, I said, I cannot believe that anyone would call someone and tell them that it's their cousin when my cousin is dead. I, I can't believe this. I said, and I have been sick, and I can't believe anyone would tr pull something on me like this. She said, but I, I know you've been sick. I was at the hospital with you. And I said, what are you talking about? And the phone started getting crackling. And then I couldn't hear. You know, it just faded away. The idea that the dead can contact the living through electromagnetic devices is certainly not new with my research. Thomas Edison, for instance, uh, several years before his death, but became very fascinated with the idea that he could invent a machine that could bring through the voices of the dead, and even apparently made some sketches of such uh, equipment. Edison, as is well known, was extremely uh, paranoid about his ideas and kept them very, very hidden. So he never patented his ideas. But certain sketches did surface after his death, which purported to be the machine he was working on. The year is 1920. Thomas Edison is 73 years old, inventor of the light bulb, the phonograph, the motion picture camera, and countless other devices the grand old man of science focuses his genius on audio contact with the spirit world. In 
Edison claimed his research was unfruitful, but some believe he was on the verge of success. In another laboratory, 60 years later, an inventor may be following in Edison's footsteps. Al Manning is the head of the ESP Center in Los Angeles, California. You might not expect a person with a, a background in aerospace to be interested in spirit contact and uh, other psychic things, but it happened for me in a very practical way. I was studying uh, a big printout of figures, and uh, I knew there was a mistake on the page, not knowing where, uh, but as I ran my finger down the column, uh, I felt a buzz under it. And sure enough, when we checked that line, that was where the mistake was. This was certainly enough to kindle my interest in spirit contact in the occult. And it led to a study of uh, ritual and ceremony to enhance the contact with spirit and other magical things. As Manning's research efforts grew, he gathered around him a group interested in exploring the field of spirit contact. If they succeed, the potential rewards could be immense. Some believe that an awesome source of knowledge may become available to those able to break through the barrier that separates the living from the dead. Al Manning recreates a moment when he claims he accomplished direct contact with a spirit entity. Uh, I was sitting in meditation one day, and a spirit showed me a picture of a device, wild-looking thing, and spoke the word mica. I didn't understand it. I said, do you mean for mica? Very clearly it came back, no, mica. I don't know how it works. While photographing Al Manning's crystal device, cameras recorded a possibly strange phenomenon. Is it a reflection, a defect in the film emulsion, or like Thomas Edison, has Al Manning made a breakthrough of possible scientific significance? The work of Thomas Edison, both in his uh, research methods and his persistence, have always fascinated me. So when we came across partial plans for a device that he had been working on to contact spirit by, re by recording their voices, uh, we uh, thought we would try once more in this area. Uh, we have done other things in the past unsuccessfully. And I don't know if this one is going to work, but uh, we're going to use the old home recorder for the cone particularly, along with an extra long antenna with flashing lights in hopes of attracting the local spirits to us so that they can participate in recording the voices. What explanation is there for the remarkable sounds recorded through Al Manning's machine late at night in the graveyard? In an old cemetery in Sierra Madre, California, members of the Orange County Society of Psychic Research have gathered to try some unusual experiments. On this day, various electronic devices will be tested for their ability to contact the dead. Harry Shepard directs the group. We are feeling for vibrations from the various markers. You can feel the outline of the spirit, and when they're there, you can just sense it. And this is the way we determine the best area to do the spirit voice recordings. I get a sinking feeling here, and the child on the other side, I get a pulling over there. It's just like uh, shots of electricity are coming out of the end of your fingers, you know, mm -hmm. and on the stone. It's cold, too, the stone. Yeah. 
There's two yeah. very, very strong entities right in this area. Mm -hmm. Very strong. I like it right coming in from the other well, Later, well, I like right, it. Right yeah. Here, but yeah. in other parts, it was cold. This one here. Feel this one here, Dick. This right would in, be right a in very good spot yeah. to, to tape, right in here. Well, that is. That's different. Isn't it? Side is yeah. a little cooler. It's even different. We have so many great locations now. Yeah. <laughs> this place is fantastic. Mm -hmm. The cemetery is good. one of the best in the area. As the group gathered psychic impressions, Technicians began setting up a battery of recording equipment. Okay, we'll be going just after dark. Two, three levels. Okay. Microphones and cable were strung out to areas that attracted the psychics. Fresh recording tape was carefully loaded into each machine and labeled. Now that the sun is set and it's dark here, you're always reminded that you wonder what kind of spirits you might run into in a graveyard. But it feels comfortable here, so let's see how it all comes out. Over here, we have our updated version of the Edison machine. Uh, we've incorporated the crystal because it gave us an interesting auric manifestation before. And this wire leads to the antenna with the flashing lights. And behind us are the tape recorders in case we get some sounds that we'll need a serious analysis later. Why don't we uh, try to get into a, a very relaxed state. Uh, everybody close your eyes and just breathe normally and let that beautiful relaxed feeling start to flow down your face, down your arms, down to your legs and out your feet and go receptive go receptive with every breath you take if there's any spirit entities here that would like to communicate with us we have three microphones mounted on this pedestal you may speak into any of these three microphones or you may rap on them for a yes or no answer. How long have you been in spirit world? Is there anyone on earth that you would like us to deliver a message to for you? Is there anything that we can do? The questions continued all night. When the session was over, more than 5,000 feet of tape had passed through the recorders. Thank you for your cooperation. The following weeks were spent analyzing the sounds recorded at the graveyard. Technician John Kawamoto spent over 30 hours noting the dozens of unusual sounds on the tapes. When his log was complete, the psychics were invited to listen to the tapes and interpret what they heard. You ready? What is that? I know. What is that? Remember that one tape that we got before that had that real weird voicing in it, that, that the real bad sounding voice? Mm -hmm. That sounds similar to it, Dick. Very, very similar to that one. Right. Remember, we did that about three years ago, and we got that rrrr sound. Oh, and there's that. Yeah, that, right. Right. Yeah, that is a beautiful one. Okay, now that we listen to the microphones, let's take a look at the telephone and see what we see. We got some fantastic stuff earlier. Let's see what we have here. If there's any spirits here, we now have this telephone with us that is attached to this microphone and at this tape recorder through here. And you can use this now, if you wish, with the other microphones to communicate with us. Can you hear me? That's loud. That's yeah, a very that loud and clear. Go back. Yeah, With normal back speed, we'll hear a, uh, the clicking. And if we slow it down to uh, 16th or 1 16th of the speed, it slows the voice way down and we can stretch it out and hear the syllables in it instead of just a click or a pop sound. 
That's right, because a lot of times when we slow it down, we can hear a word that normally you couldn't hear at normal speed. Right. 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 Okay, but this is slowed down to uh, 16 times, or we'll try it and see what happens. Okay. Can you hear me? Wow. Okay, I, I just went back. I'll go forward again. Yeah. What? No, it's definitely not. two words. Sound like yeah, it sounds like it said listen that time. It's the same. Two different voices. Help me, Help well, that me was backwards. really clear. That was really clear backwards. Now, it, and listen was forward, right? Uh huh. It's a. Excellent voice. You know, sound quality mm -hmm. of it was very, very mm -hmm. good. And I think too, the importance is slowing the tape, tape and speeding down. that. Something that you think is just a pop. You know, and this sort of taping can turn out to be all kinds of things. Now let's see how we did with the Edison machine. I think yeah, that's a great idea. Do, yeah, let's, let's see okay. what the Edison machine yeah. shows us. <laughs> get it going now. To our spirit friends, would you please direct your answers into the horn so that we can record them readily? Are you happy where you are now? Do you like this form of communications? Do you have any suggestions for improving our equipment for easier communication with you? Would you prefer that we turn off the blinking lights? Is Thomas Edison with you? Can we slow that? Oh, listen, right there. Down and listen to okay. yeah. That's right where that, that humming started, right? That, there, when that's you where the, it sounds off. like singing or, yeah. or something. Yeah. The slower and it was be. just when the lights got turned on. Oh, right. okay. You want it slow? Yeah, 16. Let's do it at the 16th speed. So the humming it's noise. Like, it's like a lot of activity or something centered right inside. You know what it actually sounds like? Like an energy uh, vortex, like an yeah. energy vortex. In That's there. what I'm saying. It's like a, it's like a center yeah, of energy. Dynamo, I tell you, this yeah. is kind of <laughs> it's a good machine. It's a dynamo working. Interesting. It's a, yeah. Let me. Is there any way that that machine could have been creating that type of sound from the inside? No, the machine wouldn't create it from the inside, but that horn will really focus the energy, so that when the spirit would direct the energy into the horn, you'd get that kind of a manifestation. Okay, but there's not any kind of way that from inside, like by, because no. of whirling or the machinery is, or something? Yeah, nothing that, is moving in there. Oh, and the that's really still. interesting. Yeah, there, there was nothing connected. The energy, you know, about, vortex right there. Uh, in the, while the pops, the squeaks, and whines recorded at the graveyard may not constitute hard evidence of spirit contact, Harry has a suggestion for those who doubt his work. If people are a bit skeptical, if they would try it themselves at least once, then there's a very good chance that they would get something on tape themselves, if they do it with an open mind. Will we ever have a major breakthrough in the field of spirit voice contact? Just as many of us are interested in trying to establish contact with the dead, the dead might be just as interested in contacting the living. Phone calls from the dead, cases of voices that appear on electronic recording equipment, and other similar manifestations might be the successful result of active experimentation on the other side to make contact with the living. There may come a day in the very distant future when contact with the dead is an everyday occurrence. But the major breakthrough leading to this result might actually be due to experiments produced by scientists on the other side and not through any attempts by us on this side of death. Lost civilizations, extraterrestrials, myths and monsters, missing persons, magic and witchcraft unexplained phenomena. In search of cameras are traveling the world, seeking out these great mysteries. This program was the result of the work of scientists 
researchers and a group of highly skilled technicians